Hi, this is Carol Baskin, and I'm here with Maddie Hawkins, the director of the Habersham County Animal Care and Control in Clarksville, Georgia. She's here at Animal Care Expo, and she has an amazing story to tell about some of the programs there. So tell us about your role there and what you do. And Over at the um, Animal Control, I am now the director of operations, um, and so for about six months. I uh, actually started out uh, about five years ago as a volunteer when I was unemployed and um, have slowly just not gone away <laughs> and um, it's I love it I mean it's my home away from home I, my landlord thinks I'm the best tenant in the world because I'm never at home I'm always at the, <laughs> at the animal shelter <laughs> Wow what was it that drew you into protecting animals I've always been an animal person um, I mean even one of the earliest memories I have is trying to push a little blue jay out of a hole in a fence and him coming back and <laughs> pecking me right in the head and um, my mom saying you know she thinks she's Dr. Doolittle um, <laughs> but it's just always I've I'm an underdog person. Um, I've been the underdog. I can relate to the underdog, and I just I feel at home with the with the shelter animals, um, the the ones that don't have a voice. You had mentioned that you were a volunteer, and I think that's really an important um, launching point for this because I tell people all the time that if you want to work with animals, there aren't that many paying jobs where you work with animals, so you need to get a job where you can make a lot of money so you can do the volunteer work mm -hmm. like you did, and then maybe work your way up to a paying job. So what did you do as a volunteer, and how did you manage to get into a paying position? Um, everything. I did everything as a volunteer. Um, I came in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I cleaned kennels with the staff. Um, you know, I walked dogs. I socialized. I drove transports. I spent a lot of my weekends driving to Louisville from Georgia, um, driving transports of dogs, driving the single transport of a cat or a dog here. Uh, I was there as much, if not more, than the staff, wow. and they could actually call me when a staff member was sick and know that I would, I would be there to come in, and eventually one of the staff members wasn't very punctual, and so they decided that since I, being an unpaid volunteer, <laughs> could seem to show up at work a little bit more often than their paid employees, I got on as a 15-hour-a-week um, kennel tech. Wow. And so I just continued to show up 40 hours a week um, and do whatever they needed me to do, and it just kind of went from there. How big of a town is this that you're working in? We are very, very rural. Um, we're, we're pretty small. Um, our facility is, is absolutely tiny, um, even in comparison to our population. I uh, did some surveys of surrounding counties and their size shelter, and um, we actually take in three times the amount of a neighboring shelter, yet our facility is 10 years older than theirs, um, wow. with a third of the kennel space. Uh, we actually have 26 kennel runs, that's it, um, for our large dogs, and our cat room quarantine consists of 10 cages, and our Cat adoption room has two. Now it has two uh, community rooms where we have the females and the males. And we do leukemia testing on everybody, and it gives the uh, adopters a way to see their personalities a lot more. But our town is is absolutely tiny. We have more cows than people, um, but we definitely have more animals than people. Definitely. Um, I mean, constantly we're saying, where did these all come from? You know, there's no way that there's this many animals. And it just, up until this year, we really haven't seen a decrease in any of our intakes. Um, but some of the programs that we're starting to implement are really starting very quickly to show drastic change in the amount of animals that come through our doors. You had mentioned that you were from Tampa, I think, before, and then moved to yes. Georgia. Yes. Uh, one of the funny things you told me was about what <laughs> people call the dogs there. Yeah. Um, when I had moved to, and I'm probably going to sound absolutely ridiculous for this, but um, it, it just definitely shows the culture shock I experienced when I moved to Georgia. Um, I thought the yard dog was a breed I had never heard of. <laughs> Be, um, people would come into our shelter and ask if we had any yard dogs, and I'm no, we don't have any yard dogs because, you know, the way I grew up and the way the culture in Florida was that, you know, our dogs didn't live chained up in the yard 24-7. Um, you know, my, my pets are my family members. And you know, the, the, the standard pretty much is anything about 15 pounds and under is a house dog. And then anything over that is a yard dog. And these dogs never step foot into a home. Um, the majority of them live on chains um, or runners out in the yard. Um, I mean, it's just... It, it, I can't even explain the, the confusion that I felt for the lack of compassion and care for the animals in our area. Wow. 
Now, it's the Habersham County Animal Care and Control. Is that a county-funded thing? Yes. Yes, we are. Um, we're the dog pound. Um, <laughs> we're the dog catchers. Um, we are totally government funded. Um, we have the pretty much the smallest budget out of any of the county entities. Um, we may do with what we have, um, and we have a very supportive um, board of commissioners and county manager. And I know that they do the best they can with what they have for us. But in our area, um, animal advocacy is just not a top priority. I know when counties are looking for where they can cut, usually the animal services are the first place to yes. take their red pen. Yes, yes. Fortunately, um, it, it was discussed a few years ago that the adoption and sheltering part of our uh, mission would be cut, um, that would we would just be a holding facility um, for the animals. They were not reclaimed. They would either be transferred to other facilities um, or euthanized. And fortunately, that only got to maybe a five-minute discussion and was immediately squashed. Good. <laughs> wow. Do you guys do any kind of fundraising in addition to the county funds, or are you even allowed to? Um, generally, we do all of our fundraising through our nonprofit partner. Um, we have a Friends of type deal um, that was recently formed. Um, it's called Habersham Help. And so a lot of the grants that we're not able to get as a county entity, um, I'm actually on their board as well as the grant writer, so I will write the grants for them, and then in turn they will sponsor um, certain events for us. Um, their volunteer base is a lot larger than our volunteer base. Uh, most people don't want to come to the dog pound or the kill shelter um, and help out, and I don't blame them. It's depressing. Um, it, it's not for everybody to be in the kennels with, with dogs that they know they might not see again next week. And so with her volunteer base, they come to our offsite adoptions, they do our fundraising, um, and we're able to get a lot further along with, with them. Um, they actually fund all of our transports as well, where we take animals to um, no-kill rescues um, in the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, we have a group that is called uh, Tailwaggers 911, and they have pulled over a thousand dogs from us in the past five years. Um, wow. And they're totally wow. foster a based. Thousand yes. From this Small yes. Ability. Yes. Uh, so you can see our intake numbers are are pretty big for <laughs> what we're working with, um, and it, it's been a long road. But we're we're doing anywhere transfers of you know 40, 50, 60 dogs to her at a time, and we um, try to partner with other facilities that have very large transport vehicles, so we're able to do this. Um, and that's usually weekend time for me that's spent driving up there. <laughs> wow. You know, I was totally oblivious to those kinds of operations where they pick up a bunch of animals from one shelter and then take them to other shelters where they have more demand for animals. Exactly. Um, this particular place in Wisconsin, this area, um, they have such strict spay neuter laws um, that you know they don't have these mixed breed dogs that we do here in Georgia. And so, what a great problem. I have. know. <laughs> um, last summer, I went up there and I spent some time with the president of the rescue, and um, I was up there for ten days. And when she went to drop me off at the airport, she pointed out, she asked me, how many stray animals did you see while you were here? Not one. Not one. No cats, no dogs, nothing running up the road. Um, there's doggy parks, there's special doggy boutiques, there's special doggy this and kitty that. And, um, you know, we're, we're lucky to find pet friendly anything in our area. You're working toward those kinds of goals, though, because yes. you were telling me about your feral cat program. So yes. Tell yes. our... We, I, we are so excited about our feral cat program, um, and to be brutally honest, I was not a fan of TNR um, a couple of years ago. I was definitely stuck on the stigma that it was easier, um, cheaper to just euthanize any ferals that came into our shelter. And when I started actually listening to people who were <laughs> talking about um, TNR and the benefits of it, um, you know, I, I learned a lot, and we wanted to start doing something like that at our shelter. Finding anything government funded for TNR is, is generally pretty hard. Um, we got a grant through Habersham Health um, that we wrote to fund our first TNR project, and it was a $4,000 grant. And with that $4,000, we have actually spayed and neutered over 120 cats so far nice. um, in the past two months. Oh my goodness. These, these are cats that would have been dead if they had come into my facility at a different time. Um, last year, we actually euthanized over 800 cats in our facility. Um, this year, from January to today, 47 cats have been euthanized. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, it's, what a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, I, it's just. Uh, and they laugh at me, my staff laughs at me because I'm like, oh, my ferals, my ferals, you know, and, uh, 
I'll be out trapping at 2 o'clock in the morning and we do, um, there's a low cost spay neuter clinic in um, Atlanta that's um, Planned Pethood and they've been doing our surgeries for us, discounted price, and um, we can bring them 20, 25 at a time and drop them off in the morning, pick them up in the afternoon and then we'll house them for about 24 hours at the shelter and um, we'll, the plan is to release them back where they came from. Unfortunately, a lot of these people that do call animal control wanting cats to lose don't want them back. So we do have some backup locations for any cats. Um, we do put them on our Facebook page, um, asking anybody if they have barns, if they have you know, wooded areas and can build a little cat house. Um, we have some chicken farmers. We're a big agricultural area, so our chicken farmers have actually been very on board um, with us donating them some pest control. And, you know, they agree they'll, they'll take care of them, feed them water and house them, and, you know, we'll fix them and give them their vaccinations, deworm them, and come pick them up. Wow. <laughs> and you said you had heard about this, and so you started listening. I'm going to try and block some of this noise <laughs> with my body. <laughs> um, you said that you had heard about how these feral cat programs were working, the TNR programs were working. Do you remember where you first heard about that? Oh, I don't remember where it first was. I mean, when you're in the animal community, you know, we, we hear a lot from a lot of people. Um, our local humane society, um, which used to be our partner group and decided to kind of go a different way, um, they were, were kind of dabbling in TNR. There was a, there's a park that we have in our city, which is known as the Cat Park. Um, and there's just, I mean, tons and tons and tons of them. But I still wasn't seeing the results of TNR because this was an area that we sort of knew that it had the issue, but we weren't getting complaints. And that's generally how we operate is we go where the complaints are. Um, I'm not going to drive around looking to steal somebody's dog or, <laughs> you know, pick up a cat. A lot of times our, in our area, they, they do roam. It's not legal, but they do. And I, I, the last thing I want to do is for an animal to end up at the shelter that doesn't need to be at the shelter. And so since we don't get complaints in that area, we didn't you know, go in there and trap, and therefore I wasn't seeing the results. So hearing them doing it, I thought, you know, what is all this? What is all this? And, but the more I actually started researching and talking to, um, you know, other people in other states and other animal controls, and that was a big thing for me, was to find out how it was affecting other animal control agencies. Um, you know, and I have some friends down in, in Tampa still that, that work with the um, Pasco County Animal Services. and. Um, a lot of these people were, were telling me that it, it does make a difference, and oh my god. <laughs> you know, this is so encouraging because I've worked with a group called No More Homeless Pets in the Tampa Bay area for a long time, and that, actually the way I met my husband was Mary Key had brought in the speaker from San Diego, I think, where they had had such great success yes. with um, a high volume spay and neuter program. And we both went to the conference and met each other there, so that's been wonderful. And that was in 2002 that I met him. But it's been really hard for this idea to catch on because so many directors of so many humane societies think the same way you did. It's like, mm -hmm. that'll never work. That's just too huge and people aren't going to accept it. And the money is, you know, where are we going to get the money for that? We've got money for euthanasia. We don't have money for that. Right. And so. It's wonderful to hear that people are one by one getting yes. that message and going, hey, I can do this too, and then seeing this. And one of the things that really helped me um, when I started first seeing all the news on TNR or SNR, which is the shelter need to return, which I learned about here, <laughs> um, which we have also started implementing, and I didn't even know what we were doing, <laughs> um, is, is the cost. And a lot of places they have this astronomical cost for euthanasia. And when I saw that, I, I automatically it turned me off to the idea of TNR because I thought it does not cost $150 to house a feral cat for four days and then euthanize it. Um, you know, so it kind of turned me off to the whole idea of it, thinking, well, if they're embellishing this, what else are they embellishing? Um, but I found a lot of other places that, you know, maybe it was just my area that this particular thing was didn't cost that much or because we have a good relationship with our vet and I actually am the one that does the euthanasia at the shelter um, so we're not paying an outside vet you know maybe these costs are different other places or I would start to find people that you know did say yeah you know it, it does cost less to euthanize them a lot less to euthanize them five or ten dollars um, but that's not what it's about you know it's, it's about those numbers and those numbers do not lie and when I can you know, look at a, a sheet of my, my data entry and go, I didn't kill a single cat 
in two months. That's um, gotta make you feel so good. There were days a year ago when I mean I remember I went home and I had euthanized 47 cats in one day. And I just, I, I can't be productive when we have days like that because it'll take me weeks and weeks and weeks to get to the point where I don't feel like I'm responsible for it. Um, and in a part, I am responsible for it because we weren't taking proactive measures to make sure that we didn't have to kill 47 cats in one day. Well, you don't know what you don't know. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, but if we're not, a lot of people get upset, and I do too, when, when animal control gets blamed for euthanasia or the lack of space. Um, but a lot of it can be remedied by, by us and what we do and what we choose to do and how we choose to, you know, implement our practices and, you know, taking a week to go to something like this that may not really have anything to do with animal control training, but it's going to change my shelter for the better when I go back. Um, you know, and some of it I, you know, isn't for us, but the things that I did learn are way, way, way more beneficial than, you know, the things that, that didn't work. Um, and I'm so excited to go back and start doing some of these um, these ideas that we've that we've learned here. Um, what were some of the take home things that you think you will be able to implement right away from Animal Care Expo? Um, so I had three classes that were my absolute favorite. Um, the first one was the innovative approaches to saving little ones, and that was about you know our small kittens and vaccination schedules. And shelter medicine is a lot different than your average you know veterinary medicine. And, you know, learning about the vaccination schedules that, you know, haven't been what our vet's been telling us that are worth a try. Because obviously somebody's having success with vaccinating them earlier, um, you know, deworming them earlier, not waiting till six weeks. Um, there, we were talking about in my last class about the fast track and how to, you know, base the, score the animals based on adoptability, get your... As much as we don't like to think about animals in a shelter as merchandise, they are. And you want to put your best merchandise out there because that's going to clear you up the most runs. And I have been incredibly guilty about putting that sob story animal out on the adoption floor in the place of an animal that I knew could have gotten out faster because I felt sorry for it and I wanted to make sure that one got home. Well, how many adoptable animals could have gone in and out in the time that I spent on that one that, you know, I could have had in quarantine working with instead? Um, so that was a, a big thing. And then also the um, open adoptions. Um, you know, making these animals available visually to the public before their hold time is up. Um, we do a five day stray hold where we are. Um, why can't we be marketing those animals in those, in those five days? Yeah. Um, you know, we put them on our Facebook page, but not too many people you know, we do still have walk-ins, we still have pet finder, we still have other other avenues for people to find our animals, and they need to they need to be seen. Um, if they're not seen, they can't they can't be saved. And that's, that's the bottom line. That's something I never never thought about. Wow, <laughs> it, it's so comforting to me to see <laughs> that you are so joyous in a job that would just crush most people and I think the reason that you feel that joy is because you really can make a difference and you can be that intervening factor for all of those animals that you do get through your doors and back out to rescue groups or out to adoptive homes mm -hmm. or even back out into feral colonies where they can live out their lives being cats. We actually have six now at the shelter that are outside. <laughs> that you know I'm, oh, I'm not quite ready I don't know if they're and they all have something wrong with them I've got the one-eyed cat um, he's out there with us we've got um, one that just kept banging her head against the trap so hard that she ended up skinning up her whole face and you know if I keep her in that cage she's just going to continue to do it and if I set her out loose somewhere the person who gets her might not give her what she needs medically so put her outside and she comes up every day for her medicine and I mean her face is looking all better and I, she's spayed of course now and um, you know it, it actually it all started with one cat that someone had left at the shelter gate one day after business hours and we came in in the morning and there was a cat in the trap sitting at the gate and um, I went to go let her out and she ran off and I thought, oh man, I should have brought her in and done an intake on her and you know, now I'm just contributing to the overfed population and um, she wouldn't come anywhere near us and she was definitely, definitely feral and so we started setting out traps um, and eventually we caught her and I thought, you know, I'm just going to spare her and turn her back loose 
and um, that's, that's our Bobby cat. Um, she's been with us for almost two years now. <laughs> and uh, every day there is a dead mouse or something on our doorstep. She, she pays rent every day on time. <laughs> um, and <laughs> It's nice to know that your work was appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And she's, you know, after we started doing that, it was like, wait a minute. You know, there's this cat would have been dead. If we brought her into the shelter that day, she would have been dead. Um, and while we still can't pick her up, or I mean, she'll come and she'll rub on us, and she'll she's a nice girl. She's a nice girl, and she she wouldn't she wouldn't be with us today if we just if we had done something as simple as bring her in the doors. Um, we we usually before would I mean most feral cats get euthanized on intake. Um, they'd be scanned for microchip. If they were deemed feral, then that was it. Um, there wasn't even a whole. We don't even have a holding time in our ordinances for, um, for feral cats. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm scouring, looking for. <laughs> you know, I'm trapping till two o'clock in the morning. I need feral cats. You know, <laughs> we're just not having the volume of cats that that we were already. And um, you because know, because they're not reproducing. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, some of the places that we went to, the cats were just attacking each other, you know, eating the babies because they just, the people couldn't handle what, what they had and they were just reproducing at such a rate that, you know, they, they couldn't do anything. And you could tell their hearts were in the right place. They wanted to do the right thing. Um, so there were a couple particular places we went in and, you know, 40, 30, you know, whatever cats. And now it's like this little cat parrot. They all just lay around together and hang out. And yeah. um, most of the kittens that were there, we were actually able to um, tame and um, adopt out. I don't have any of the kittens left from that house at all. Um, there was one, and oh, I love this little guy. He would sit on top of my traps, and he would never go in. He was like my little arch nemesis kitten, and he was just this little fuzzy black thing. His eyes were all matted shut. He was scraggly, missing hair. Um, I mean, he was a mess. And finally, one night, I went out with a flashlight, and I, I caught him when he was sleeping with my hands. <laughs> and uh, we sent him off to. Um, I, I, well, at first I, I brought him home because he was just in such rough shape, and I treated him for his upper respiratory, and he got to the point where um, he wasn't cleaning himself, so I'd have to give him a bath every night. And then he eventually got to the point where he would let me blow dry him, and he'd lay back, and I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. Um, and when we sent him to get spayed, uh, or sent him to get neutered, I'm sorry, we, um, the spay-neuter clinic called and said, you know, hey, we we can place this little guy, you know, Aww. can we keep him? Of course! <laughs> and that's saying something, because black cats are hard to place. Exactly, exactly, and he would, you know, he was just such a nasty little thing when I found him, and he turned into the most lovable little little cat ever, and it, I mean, maybe a week or two, maybe a week wow. or two, and you know, there's a lot of the adults that might not ever decide that, you know, they, they want to be a, a house cat, but that's okay, that, that's okay, um, you know, they, they totally deserve the same, the same options as, as any other cat, and they're they're happy outside. I mean, they're they're so happy. When we did our first release, our large release in an area, I the best part was opening those traps and letting them out and watching them, you know, shoom! <laughs> <laughs> Tell them they'll be back. Don't worry. You know, it was just that initial feel of oh, I'm free. You know, they didn't kill me because I, I'm sure they know. I'm sure they know when they see me coming that it, it might not end well for them. And now, um, you know, we've, we've actually gotten really good at trapping. Um, uh, some of my animal control officers still kind of, they, they trap like animal control officers. Um, I'm trapping like a feral person now. So we've got our, our newspaper in the trap, and you you got to cover the um, the plate so they don't see it because they're smart. They're smarter than we give them credit for. Um, and I've been telling my officers again and again, if you set those traps where they can see their friends in there, they're not going to go in. They know. They know. You gotta hide them. You gotta disguise them. You know. And uh, there was one house I went out on. And my my officers had had trapped all day and didn't catch a single thing. And I went out about 7:30 and reset all the traps with paper in them, moved them around a little bit, and it's a ching ching ching. The traps are going off. <laughs> Lady's like, you must be part feral cat. <laughs> I actually learned something at this conference from uh, Dave Foley, who was talking about humane trapping, and he. <laughs> I'm usually having to trap a bobcat that's been hit by a car, so the, you know they're dragging themselves around out there in the woods, and I can't find them, so I end up setting a trap. But they're so smart, they will like reach past that plate to get whatever it is. So he buries it in a can underneath the 
trap so that they have to kind of dig around at the floor to get oh. to it and then they set off the, the plate. And it's like, oh, that is genius. I can't yes. to do that. Yes. <laughs> we, we do have some. That's why we started covering our plates because they will lean over and I've had them, you know, bite it. And you'll, you'll see the can, you know, all shredded, you know, five feet away. They do that, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're smart. They like will it out of the can. Yes. <laughs> Exactly, but my favorite are the ones that just sit on top of the traps. Like, hey, lady, yeah. It's <laughs> a statement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in Florida, they have an association of animal control yes. agencies. Do they have this in Georgia? We do. Um, GACA, which would be the Georgia Animal Control Association. Um, they're not I very. Thought FACA was no, bad. <laughs> no, GACA. Yeah. Um, they're not very active right now. Um, but we do have the National Animal Control Agency, um, NACA. Sounds a little bit better. Um, there were uh, two representatives here oh, at good. the. Mm -hmm, um, the executive director was here, um, and then one of their uh, gentlemen that does the training courses was here. Um, so I'm, I'm finally actually going to be going to NACA in uh, September. Um, so five years later, I'm going to officially get some <laughs> some animal control training. <laughs> and do you think that they would be able to? bring this to other animal control agencies? Definitely, definitely. NACA um, is trying very hard to change the, the stigma that animal control agencies have. Um, it's very big on education. Um, NACA is, is all about TNR right now. Um, they've actually changed the the name, uh, the official name from the National Animal Control Association to the National Animal Care and Control Association. Hmm. Um, so they, they've gotten on board with that. Um, I mean, they, they try definitely to keep it positive and to, you know, highlight the agencies that, that are doing the, these positive outreach things for the community um, because that's, that's the way to educate people. Um, well, it sounds like you're going to be one of those people they're going to be trotting up on stage. Saying, yeah. Look, they did it right here in Hammerton County. <laughs> we we uh, <laughs> tend to hang around with the, more of the Humane Society folks, but it's I mean they're they're a really good organization, and um, you know they're it's national certification, but it, it's a lot more animal control is a lot more than it used to be. You know, it used to be you know just going out there with a net and catching that dog, and you know we we deal with a lot more than people think. Um, you know, and I, I get a lot of people that tell me, oh, I'd love to have your job. You work with animals all day. Well, I also have to work with people all day. <laughs> and as we were discussing earlier, you know, some of the surrender reasons that we get. And, you know, being able to maintain professional in a situation where somebody comes in to surrender their 12-year-old cat because they don't like cats. Um, it's, it's just so unthinkable. Uh, can prove to be difficult. And this was not a new cat that someone acquired at age of 12. This was a cat that they've had since they were a kid. Um, you know, or the person that says that their dog doesn't need to be fixed because it's a male and it only gets off the chain for two hours a day. Um, you know, a lot of this is, is, is ignorance. Um, and it's and selfishness from what you were telling me about what some of these people, I, I would never dream that somebody would come in and say, I don't want this animal yeah. and I don't want anybody else to have them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had situations like that where, you know, somebody has had to move and they are putting their animal in as an owner surrender euthanasia request because they don't want anybody else to have it. And uh, fortunately, you know, a lot of places will kind of prey on the fact that owner surrenders don't have a hold time. Um, I, I, You'll see some facilities where, um, you know, Facebook fanatics or, or certain advocates will tell people to, you know, lie and say it's a stray so that it can have that hold time. Um, at our facility, you know, I kind of value our owner surrenders. I can learn a lot more about those owner surrenders um, if people are honest with us. Even with the guy that didn't like cats, you know, because I, is it, is it the cat? No, it's just all cats. Well, okay, so then you're telling me this cat has no particular behavioral issues. You know, I, I can learn so from that. Yeah. And I can, you know, has it lived inside? Well, yeah. Okay, well, that's a reason not to like it. Okay, but good. I know it uses a litter box. Um, you know, and so we can gather more information on them that way, and we can, we can move them out faster. And while they might not have a hold time per se, you know, we also don't necessarily euthanize something that somebody brings in and says it's an owner surrender euthanasia. Um, it's, it's up to the, the shelter discretion as to whether or not that animal is a candidate for euthanasia because friendly, healthy animals should not be, should not be euthanized. Um, unfortunately, it is part of our job with space issues, but um, as an incoming animal, no.
Um, and there's been a couple situations where some people have gotten upset with me um, for sending their animal to rescue or adopting their animal out um, that they had surrendered for euthanasia. But I, I can sleep on that. I, I have no problem with, with that. Um, you know, I can think of plenty of other reasons that I have made people upset that might, you know, upset me as well, but <laughs> that's definitely not one, one of them. What kind of advice would you give to people who are either dealing with a bunch of cats that um, are not technically theirs, or if they are in a situation like, I talked to a lady here at the conference who was talking about setting up a hospice, uh, rescue because those people are dying and mm -hmm. their animals do have to go somewhere. So what kind of advice would you give to people who legitimately have to find a home or have to find a solution? I, I would definitely suggest, you know, getting with your local shelter, animal control, humane society, whatever it is in your area before the last minute. Um, that's one of our biggest issues is we have people come in and say, I have to move today. A lot of these cases, you know, you knew you had to move. You got that eviction notice 30 right. days ago. <laughs> um, you know, because what we try to do is when people come to us and they say, I think I might have to relinquish my animal, what we try to do is we try to network it for them without it having to come into the shelter. And there's been quite a few cases where we've been successful with this. Um, and then we just hook the two people up. There you go. Your animal has a home. It didn't have to come in here. I didn't have to euthanize somebody to make room for it. And I also never had to euthanize your animal either. Um, you know, that's... Or expose it to the Exactly, feet. exactly. And that's, that's a big thing. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, rescues won't take on a relinquished animals. They do have to come into the shelter first. Um, but if we're able to notify these rescues ahead of time that, hey, I might have, you know, say boxer rescue. I might have a boxer coming in. Here's pictures. Here's his information. Will you be able to help him when he comes in? Um, that's a lot easier on the animal than it is, you know, and on the staff at the shelter. Um, you know, I think the hospice care for pets would be an amazing idea. We do see quite a lot of that and, and very often the animals are not in top condition either. Um, you know, their owners weren't, their owners were struggling physically, mentally, and while they do, you could tell they did love and care about their animals, there there are usually some health issues that are associated with those. And if an animal comes into the shelter with, with health issues, it's generally not the best the best option to be directly in the shelter. Um, one of the things that I'm also really, really big on that for some reason is hard to get people to work with me on is I ask them to come in about 72 hours before they want to relinquish their animal. And I'll have them actually do the paperwork and everything, but what I'll do is I'll vaccinate that animal. So that way they're big, they built up some immunity before they come into the shelter. That's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> but again, <laughs> finding people that will hold on to their pet for three days because once you make that decision that it needs to be gone, I think emotionally they need it gone. Um, because the more they have to sit and look at that animal and know that you know it has to go to the shelter. Um, or even know. fear that seeing the shelter is going to make them change their mind which they probably should, right. but people don't want to expose them to something that might change their mind. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, maybe come to the shelter and, and you know, meet the staff or volunteer, you know, if you have to relinquish your animal, come spend a couple of days with us and, you know, see how, how the animals get treated, see how, you know, how they live, where they live. It might give you a little bit more peace of mind than, than just thinking that they're shut into a kennel and they're, they're forgotten about. Um, in reality, they don't get what with us what they would get at home. But um, you know, the more presence somebody has there, and I don't know if all shelters would be welcome to, you know, let people come visit their animals or anything like that. I know we are, and we've actually had a few people that when they did, I changed my mind. I can't do it. Let me take it back. Okay, you know. <laughs> um, that might actually be a really good policy. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely are all about it. Um, generally, we don't adopt back out to people that um, have surrendered something. We, we had some issues in the past with using our shelter as a boarding facility, um, which is definitely not fair. Um, people would knowingly go on vacation and, you know, surrender their animal because it was cheaper to spend the $50 to surrender it than it was to board it. Um, you know, I heard somebody else at the conference here saying that one of the scams that pet owners are playing on animal control is that they will surrender their animal for them to be fixed mm -hmm. and then try to go back and reclaim the animal because it's cheaper than going to a vet. And it was like, 
wow. It's yeah. just hard to imagine that people would do that. But it's if you're going problem. through those lengths to get spay and neuter done, you know, that, I have no problem with that. <laughs> but we, I mean, I've actually had, you know, that's been another surrender reason where, you know, people put that on their surrender paperwork, going on vacation. Oh, I'll come back and pick it up. Well, you just gave me a dog aggressive pit bull. Your dog's not going to be alive to get here when you get back. Um, you know, go, you don't have a friend, you can't board it. I've got mine in the hotel room with me. <laughs> you know, um, that's, but then again, I'm one of these crazy critter folks, so... <laughs> Where do you see yourself five years from now? Hopefully still where I'm at. Um, I'm incredibly happy there. Um, I would like to see myself where I am, but I would like to see my surroundings change. Um, I would like to see our area, you know, definitely more more into the care and compassion that, that we don't show our animals right now. Um, I think that by staying in one place, I, I can make a difference, even if it's just a small little thing like not euthanizing 800 cats. Well, that's um, not small to the you know, 800 cats. <laughs> in the big scheme of, of, you know, the shelter and the county and life, it might not be the, the biggest deal, but, you know, those those things, they, they add up. Um, you know, and, and I'm very comfortable where I am. I That that, that shelter is my home. Um, I, I love being there. Um, I mean, it's kind of bad how much I'm there. Um, but I, I would definitely just, just like to see more more of our area progressing. Um, and I, I want to be there to see it. Um, I, I definitely want to be there to see it because... Well, I really hope you get the community support that you need because it sounds like it would be a great place for kids to come on field trips to see, you know, this is the result of not uh, being responsible mm -hmm. and curb that behavior early on since you may have a cultural issue that you're having to deal with. So at some point yeah. <laughs> you have to intervene well we do a lot of um you know humane education the best we can and it's, it's me that goes out there and does it um so we don't have how you have time yeah uh, my job is director adoptions rescue intake vet tech um kennel tech i mean we have right now um since i'm here animal control and the shelter is being run by one full-time person one 30-hour person and one 15-hour person oh um that's our staff mm. and me and so, you know, we, we don't have all these other, you know, rescue coordinator and volunteer outreach and, you know, it's, it's kind of all us, but I think it helps to put a face to the name, too, because not only do they, you know, people see me out doing the community outreach, but they'll see me trapping cats, they'll see me cleaning kennels, they'll see me doing adoptions, and so it puts a little bit more of a personalized face um, to our agency because everybody does everything. There's no, you know, that's not my job. Um, you know, my, my animal control officers clean kennels, um, they run calls, they do data entry, um, and we all do everything together. And I think that's why we work so well together. Um, we're, we're definitely bonded, and you have to be in that kind of work. If you don't have the kind of people that you can talk to about what you're feeling and, you know, what we do, because we do have very emotional jobs. A very emotional jobs. Um, I mean, we, we literally end the lives of animals. And, and I can't think of anything anything worse. And, and being the one that has to be there when they, you know, take their last breath. And watching them, you know, walk up to me going, oh, it's Maddie, you know, because they know me and they're comfortable. And that's that's actually one of the reasons I, I got certified to do euthanasia because it, was, it seems a lot stressful on the animals. It's harder on me, but they know me. They're comfortable with me. They don't get scared when they see me coming. They don't get scared when I take them out because they go, oh, it's Maddie, we're going for a walk, I'm going to get cookies. And so they, they, they pass with somebody that they know. Um, you know, they're not being pulled out in mass numbers and, you know, being euthanized by a vet that doesn't know them, that they don't know. And they know, I mean, they know what's going on, but it's making them comfortable in their last, you know, their last moments because that's, you know, a lot of them, that's, that's all they've known is that kennel. Um, it, but every now and then you get that one that, you know, there we had one, a dog, we have had him for eight months. And to live eight months at a kill shelter has got to speak volumes for this dog's personality. Wow. And I, I just couldn't do it. I, I could not put this dog down. And he had every issue you could think of. You know, he had the barrier aggression, he had dog aggression, he had cat aggression. I mean, and he was just a plain old brown dog. 
and there was just something about him that he was just so smart and he would see me coming with that box and he knew what it was and he would run to the outside part of his kennel wow. every other time he'd come right to the front door well after a very long amount of time and we started i started doing some behavior enrichment programs um, Bound Angels in Malibu um, has sent me a lot of literature on, on how to work with shelter dogs, and so we've been implementing that. And Hash Brown, this dog, was my project dog for to see if this program worked. By the end of the two weeks that we worked with him, I had that dog in my home with my two cats and my dog. Oh, wow. Not a problem. Not a problem. Isn't that something? And my thing was that I was coming here, and I said, Saturday, we have an adoption event. If he doesn't get adopted Saturday... I'm going to have to put him down before I come here. Friday night at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got the strangest Facebook message from somebody that had seen me sharing his pictures of him interacting with my animals. He had been lost for over a year from a county away. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and she came and she picked him up on Saturday. Oh. And had pictures of him since he was a puppy with the, with the boys. And she had two little boys. And they were just so happy to have their dog back. And if you think how many times. Yeah. Oh, my word. I mean, there was week after week after week that this dog did not get euthanized just because, because I don't know, divine intervention. I mean, and everyone was telling me, Maddie, it's not fair. You know, you need to put him down. There's other dogs that are being put down. And I, I knew it wasn't fair, but there was just something, and I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Eight months at, at a county dog pound in Georgia. Wow. And he got out on the very last day to his original. And they never thought to check with us because they don't live in our county. They never thought to check with us. I interviewed a lady yesterday who runs a pet detective agency, and they take shelter dogs and train them to find cats. Oh gosh, I love it! <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they say only like one out of 18 dogs is really good at this because it has to be a dog that loves cats. Mm -hmm. So this dog wouldn't have been a candidate for it. <laughs> but not until after you start yeah. working with it anyway. <laughs> but what she was saying is that people give up way too soon in finding their animals mm -hmm. and they don't think, like you said, to try the next county over. The dog doesn't know where the county line is. Exactly. Nobody looks for their cats either. Nobody looks for their cats. Um, we we had a couple a few months ago that came in to adopt a cat and realized that their cat was in our shelter that had been missing for three years. Oh my word! And you know, no micro. I don't know how they recognized. I mean, I guess it's your like your own, children. you know. <laughs> um, but I just three years, you know. <laughs> and, and you never thought to call. <laughs> and it just happened to be, you know, the week that this particular cat had come in, and the week that they were. They came in to look for a new pet. I mean, nobody looks for their cats. And a lot of times, you know, the descriptions, um, we always tell people, we, we do have a Facebook page and it's very active. Um, I, I do that too. <laughs> um, you know, so it's not like it's volunteer run, it's the staff looking at it to put your, the pictures of your animals up. Because your description might not match my description. And if you knew how many brown tabbies we have in our shelter, Wow. Um, you know, and cats can travel a good distance. Oh, they can, gosh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> even the little cats. Um, you know, you, you don't have to be a tiger to go miles. <laughs> I have to get stuck up under the undercarriage of cars and get carried for hundreds of miles and drop yeah, so We they, we had one that, my gosh, he was one of our um, outside cats. He was uh, a little bit too fat to fit in any of the cages, and uh, Fat Albert was his name. <laughs> and he's big orange tabby and he had the habit of going for rides with people and I had gone from Clarksville to Blairsville which is probably about 30 miles um, up and down a mountain so we're winding roads I get out at Blairsville to drop the dog off I was bringing to a rescue and I hear meow <laughs> and here he comes popping out from under the animal control truck <laughs> oh <laughs> I, I couldn't believe he didn't get so long out. Like, yeah, he was, yeah, I'm here. Okay, let me in now. Let me in the in the truck. Um, I mean, he was a hoot. He was a hoot. I mean, some of these cats, like, but it's it's so easy. It's so easy. I mean, I I didn't notice he was there. I no clue, no clue. Till he started meowing when I got out. Um, I mean, he couldn't fall out anywhere. And this was two or three counties away. I was driving once, and I just happened to look up my rearview mirror, and there's a cat 
spread eagle over the back window of the car holding onto the rubber gasket. <laughs> I'm just like, he must have been sleeping on the back of the car when I got in and I didn't look back there. And, and that's another that, um, you know, we try to pe tell people during the winter time, bang on your car hood. Yeah. Um, because that's one of our big calls in the winter time uh, for animal control is that somebody started their car and there was a cat in the engine. Um, and it's not usually bode well for the cat. No, it, it does not. And then there's really not any way I can get in there. You know, I'm not a mechanic. I can't lift this engine out. And it's, you know, a lot of these times these cats are injured and they're, they're staying in the back because, you know, what, what injured cat is going to go, oh, yes, I'll come to you. Um, they're stressed. They're scared. They're hurt. Um, and they, it's, oh. So just, yeah, we always tell people, bang on your car hood, especially in the wintertime. Um, so they're, they're going in there because it's warm. It's Even a nice... Florida, it's mm -hmm. just that much warmer on a cold night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, I mean, there's there's been cats that, you know, by the time somebody called that they, they haven't been alive anymore. Um, and and I think what, what really made me aware of it, I, I didn't know. And it, it happened to me. And, um, I mean... I felt so bad. I felt so bad. And, um, you know, because it just it had never been something that you talked about, you know? It's like all of this stuff. If you've never heard about it or mm -hmm. you've never been exposed to it, you just, there's so much. <laughs> Doing these interviews, I find there's so much I don't know. I thought I knew about cats. I don't yeah. know anything because I find these people have these amazing insights into them. And usually it's through trial and error that we learn them. It's not, uh, it's not just personal knowledge. It's, uh, you know, unfortunate circumstance. Because that's what makes, I mean, that's for me what, what initiates change is when something is, is not working or something terrible happens. Um, then I'm going to go out I'm going to find out why this happened, how I can prevent it. If everything's going smoothly and wonderfully, then, you know, why do I need to go out and bang on car hoods? You know, because before that happened, it wasn't something that I thought, let me Google this and make sure, you know, cats don't get in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's amazing the places they can get in. <laughs> That's for sure. You mentioned that you guys have volunteers. What does the person have to do to volunteer with you? Oh, um, we, anybody coming directly to the shelter, um, as long as uh, we do volunteers that are 16 and up um, without parent. Um, anybody 16 or 17 has to have a parent signature on their a waiver, um, and anybody. That's good though, because a lot of places. Uh, most of our, under 18. yeah, most of our plate our, our volunteers are our children, um, and anybody that's under 16 is more than welcome to come to us. Um, they just have to have a parent or guardian with them. Uh, a lot of times, some of the Boy Scouts, Girl Scout troops will have certain badges or, or patches that they'll do, and they'll send one parent with three or four children, and that's fine, um, as long as they're all together in the same area. Uh, our, we have a very prominent FFA and 4-H in our area, too, as well. So one of the community outreach programs that the students do is they have to come to the shelter and do volunteer work. Um, most of them just kind of want to walk dogs and stuff like that. But you will get the occasional kid that says, I want to scoop poop. <laughs> Sign me. Hey, come on, let's go. You know, we, we generally try to keep the smaller people, or smaller people, but the, um, you know, the, the children out of the shelter until we're physically open because we do use chemicals um, and we generally don't want anybody around, um, you know, anything that, that could hurt them. Uh, we have the indoor-outdoor kennels on the dogs, so everybody goes outside during the cleaning process. And, um, you know, so we do use lots of bleach and, and stuff like that, um, wet floors. So we try to keep our volunteers that are younger, um, you know, during the regular business hours when they can do more of the warm, fuzzy stuff like walk dogs or, you know, bathe the puppy or brush the cats, um, do some behavior enrichment, which is something new that we're starting to, to do. Um, we didn't do that before. Um, and it's amazing the difference a little ball or a feather in the cat cage can make or giving a dog a bone. We've had such a problem with the dogs chewing on the poles outside. Give them a bone. I mean, <laughs> it took me years to figure this out. Give them something to tear up. Um, and what we've started doing is collecting old water bottles and socks. And we'll tie the sock in a knot around, we'll put the water bottle in the sock and tie it in a knot and give it to the dog. And it's a nice crunchy toy. Mm -hmm. If they shred it, it's free. It doesn't matter. Everybody has old socks with holes in them they don't want anymore. Um, you know, we're right next to the recycling center, so we've been telling people, hey, instead of going to the recycling center, bring me your bottles. Um, 
we haven't had the, the dogs love it. The dogs love it. It keeps them busy. It's noisy. It aggravates me. So of course they love it. You know, <laughs> it, it's almost as good as a squeaky toy. <laughs> We found with our big cats, the stuff that we give them, it's all free. It's paper towel tubes mm -hmm. sprayed in perfume or uh, toilet paper tubes that have had spices, catnip or something mm -hmm. inside them. Paper bags. They <laughs> love. Oh, cardboard boxes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we get everything that we get, you know, shipped or delivered to us. You're going to save those boxes for the cats. You know, and even if after, you know, two or three days they've shredded it and they've pooped in it or whatever, throw it out. Get them a new one. It's a box. You know, <laughs> and it's great amusement for them because they are—they're so smart and they're just bored out of their minds in cages. So it's, with my facility, anyway, our cats are there for life, and so mm -hmm. it's a constant struggle. And every day we try to get them something different to do. Right, and there was the um, cats. Uh, there was a class on the cats improving outcomes for shelter cats, and I took that one too. Um, my friend that came up here was like, "Why are we taking all cat classes?" <laughs> so because I know how to do the dogs, I don't know how to do the cats. New. Um, <laughs> it, 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 they are, and it used to be something that most animal controls just had the cats. There's so many of them, what are we going to do? Well, now that we're able to decrease our numbers through the TNR, we can actually focus on the cats as individuals, not just this cats, you know, cat one, two, three. Well, everybody's got names and personalities, and we've started doing a um, new campaign on our Facebook that's Whiskers Wednesday, and we'll do a pick one of our cats and highlight one of the cats. Aww. And it's just a Facebook campaign and it's silly, but we'll have them, they'll do a little photo shoot with a cat, we'll get some little angel wings and hats and things like that. We'll dress them up and, um, you know, so far, we, we've done two so far, so again, very, very new, um, but both those cats have been adopted. We found that if we put our foster kittens on Facebook, people line up around the block, it's like, just go to the Humane Society, they're all going to be there in a week. Yeah. <laughs> you put them on Facebook and people have to have that cat. <laughs> and that's how we do Facebook is a majority of our networking. Um, and it, our, our area, like I said, is just so rural that nobody really comes looking for animals. We've, we've had a much better response for people looking for barn cats than we have people looking for companion cats. Um, and that's that's okay. That's okay. Um, but we've, and, and cat rescues in our area are far and few between. Um, they, they're kind of like pit bull rescues. You know, you hear a lot about them, but you really don't see them. <laughs> um, and so we, we've got a couple groups that have pulled one or two from us, um, you know, or, or kittens, or, um, you know, occasionally when they get space and they have a transport, you know, hey, look, Habersham, you know, we can take four or five cats. Um, and and that's, that's great. But a lot of our cats have been there for quite a long time. Um, we have some that are six months, eight months a year. Um, and these are just such great cats that, you know, we, we don't necessarily base our euthanasia based on time at our shelter. Um, we do euthanize and we do have to, you know, we luckily haven't done any cats in the past two months, but um, uh, it, it's on an animal per animal basis because I'm that cat that's friendly and has stayed healthy the entire time in the shelter. And we're, we're fortunate enough to have our cat adoption room be a, um, actually go in and I don't remember what the word I was earlier was, but, um, you know, people can, they're not in cages. Um, they're more of a free range, cage free, <laughs> <laughs> free range of chickens. Yes, <laughs> free range cats. Um, and the room is separated into two large enclosures and then we have the females and the males. Um, and so it's, it's a lot nicer for the people to be able to interact with them. But for the cats, I mean, it's not having to sit in that tiny little cage. Um, because they will go crazy, and, and some of the sweetest cats will turn into just mean, 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 mean critters, um, just because they're not mentally being exercised, and uh, we had one when I first started volunteering there, he cracked me up, he had been there for a while, and he, we named him Tweak, <laughs> so that might give you a little insight onto his personality, but he would take all the newspaper and he would line it up against the door of the cage so you couldn't see in, and he would make a little slit, and when you walked by, he would pow, pow, um, and, but, you know, he didn't have any other way to expel that energy, and so when people would walk by the cage, they'd get swiped. 
<laughs> and, you know, we don't have that problem anymore with our large adoption room. Um, you know, they can climb, they have cat trees, um, you know, we, we have the litter boxes inside of a bench so that, you know, someone can go in there and they don't even have to look at the litter box and the cats can also use it in privacy. Um, there's balls and the kids can actually go in there, which is a big selling point because a lot of times people go, oh, is it good with kids? Well. Let's really, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to find someone that, hey, can I borrow your six-year-old? Um, let me see if this dog eats it. But it's a lot easier for someone to go with their child and sit in the cat room and have cats come on their lap and pet them. Um, it's a lot less intimidating than, you know, throwing somebody in a dog kennel. Um, and so it's it's gotten our cats to the point where they're very desensitized when it comes to people. Um, you know, dogs, and they're just, I mean, they're just such well-rounded cats that we have, and I think that's part of the reason that they've, they've stayed so long, the ones that, you know, are, are long-timers. Um, I mean, I can walk a dog in there to temperament test a dog, and they'll all just lay around or come rub up on him. Um, I, so, it, it, it not only benefits, you know, the people coming in to adopt, but it benefits those cats because, you know, they're, they're just not stressed out by some things that would stress out a cat that lives in a tiny little metal box his whole life. Um, you know, he sees a dog come and he's going to get all puffed up and get that exclamation point tail up and, um, you know, these guys are like, eh, dog, you know, <laughs> we're used to it, you know, <laughs> which makes them able to find a home faster too because I can say this cat's good with dogs, this cat's good with kids, this cat, you know, with chaos. <laughs> yeah, does use the litter box because a lot of times, you know, we'll get people that complain about the um, elimination and they'll surrender their animal, but in that tiny little cage, they have no option but to go in the litter box. When they're in the big cage, I can actually tell if someone's not pooping in the box or not. Um, can't always tell who it is, but, um, you know, we generally figure it out if one's been labeled as the uh, house soiler or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, you know, them having that additional space just, I mean, makes such, such a big difference. Such a big difference. Wow. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. An hour has gone by. Oh, my gosh, really? <laughs> and this thing will shut off in about an hour. So <laughs> thank you so oh, much. Oh, no, thank Maddie, you. Thank you. Joining us. And I really hope I can clear up the audio on this. <laughs> it was great stuff. It was just so noisy inside and it turned out to be pretty noisy outside yeah. as well. Well. <laughs> I do, I, I like do. To do is, and I also uh, have my I Heart Feral Cats button on. <laughs> had to had to represent. <laughs> I'll put your contact information oh, cool, at the cool. bottom of the video and I'll send you a link to it. Awesome, that would be that would be super cool. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much. We are all about trying to get get our, our stuff out there now. I mean, we've just been such bad guy dog catchers for so long and it's it's just I mean, I'm so grateful I got to come here. So grateful I got to come here.